Men, do you ever feel like you just can't get ahead? Like you're misunderstood? Like you have no one to talk to that truly hears you? And women, are you often frustrated, hurt, and saddened in your relationships with the men in your life? What if there were a community of like-minded men going through the same challenges that would support, hear, and understand what you're going through? Working together in unison to create understanding, intimacy, and strong connections. That's the Way of the Illuminated Warrior. Way of the Illuminated Warrior talk show is a forum of candid conversations for men and women about men. Being a man today is not always easy. Until now. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Way of the Illuminated Warrior talk show. I am Waski, your host, and I am totally stoked because I got my brother from another mother, George <laughs> Blitch, in the house. What is up, brother? Man, I am so excited to be here with you today, man. It's so good to see your face. I I'm, I'm, can't wait to get into all these awesome things we're going to chat about. Yeah, this is exciting. And I just noticed, like, we, did, we actually did not talk about color coordinating today, but I just noticed we're both wearing blue, which is very nice. That's right. I think we, we head in the heart must have known, but you head know. in the heart. I'm wearing my free Peltier <laughs> underwear, which we'll get into in a little while. So we are, <laughs> we are in sync. So I'm stoked about this because we know each other for, for a few decades now. And you know, when I thought about it, doing this show with you, there's, there's very few people. And you tell me if you have other peeps in your life, there's very few people in my life that I could have this conversation with because, um, I feel, I know I'm blessed. I'm sure you feel the same way. We have been blessed to sit with, to interact with, to befriend like what we call wisdom keepers and elders and indigenous sacred souls that I know for me have enriched my life so much. Um, and we're going to talk about the free Peltier um, poster behind you because you've had a lot of interactions and doing sacred work um, about Leonard Peltier through Harvey Arden, who we're going to talk about. And it's just this is going to be a rich conversation. There's so much there to talk about. So you and I, let's go back to the beginning of our existence where we, we, we good. recognize each other as, as brothers. Yes. That's right. <laughs> so I don't even remember the first time we met, but it was definitely through... Uh, I believe Harvey and documenting maybe it was uh, Chief Orville Looking Horse or Grandma Edna. Do you recall what that first situation was? I was thinking about this the other day. So I, just a quick little segue. I met Harvey in 2000. I put on an event in December, I think December 6th of 2000 at Northeastern University up in Boston where I, I was going to school. And he came down and uh, he was like the main speaker. And he and I we were late to our own event because we were just hanging out chit chatting and just like, I mean, that guy's a wealth of knowledge. For those who don't know, Harvey Arden was a National Geographic staff writer for 23 years. 25. Uh, 25. I think it was 25. I'm always cutting him short. That's what he told I'm me always anyway. Cutting him short. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> we're going to go with 24 maybe because I don't know. All right. No, but but uh, he also had a bunch of best selling books, uh, worked a lot with indigenous elders, Native American elders, and, and leaders across the world. And so when we got to chatting and meeting up, we became really close and great friends. And then he invited me to work on this project. And he's like, hey, come on out and meet some some people we're going to be in uh, i think it was like long island or maybe it was another spot in new york but it was somewhere around there and it was a sweat lodge with chief orville looking horse and i believe that was the first time i might have met you um if it wasn't the first time i knew that like we started kind of hearing about each other because you were like a correspondent you were, had your own stuff with world harmony and there was a lot of cross collaboration with Harvey at the time, but then I know we did a lot of work with Edna too, but yeah, it, in my mind, it was a sweat lodge yes. in August of 2001. I, 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 I remember that. And like, you know, again, you and I could talk about this. When I first got into the whole indigenous world, like I, you know, I didn't even know what a sweat lodge is, which they also, they refer to as like the Anipi. It's a, it's a purification mm -hmm. ceremony, but, but to be with the, the leader of the Lakota, Nakota, Dakota nation, the 19th generation keeper of the sacred calf pipe, Chief Orville Looking Horse, in that sacred space. I mean, uh, what was that like for you? I know what it was like for me. I mean, I still, I still get shivers today thinking about it. I do too. And I knew how sacred and special it was to be invited to be a part of a, a ceremony like that and to 
because right after that, there was a, a meeting at, um, it was in New York. And, uh, I, I remember it was like maybe a few days after that. So this was kind of a lead up to it. So I was invited to go to that as well at the United nations building mm -hmm. and he, yes. Orville was giving a speech there. And so I was kind of there with Harvey as kind of a second man on hand to, you know, record and, and kind of just take in that in information that was going on and, and document it. And so I was like, wow, sweat lodge. I've never done one before. And then someone introduces me to chief Orville and we start talking and he's kind of staring at me like pretty strong. And I'm like, <laughs> ah, is, am I the outsider here? Am I not where I'm supposed to be? And whenever he brought everyone into the sweat lodge, he's like, wait. And I was like, yeah. And right before we went in, he was like, I want you to sit next to me and help me. And I just remember feeling like, oh, wow, I'm so honored. I didn't realize how big of an honor that was yeah. until later on in life. And for that to be my first, you know, ceremony like that, it was, I mean, it, it kind of, it, it started off mind. pretty strong. Yeah. So everything from there on, uh, I would made sure that I was really paying attention to what I was walking in through and really being in that moment and just soaking it all in and being as present and as focused and as true as I could in that time. Cause it was, I knew I had been let in through some doors that yeah. not a lot of people get let into, man. Yeah. Yeah. So true. So I'm flashing back when you're saying that, um, cause I sat with Orville, um, and Paula, his partner a number of times mm -hmm. and Dave chief. Um, right. so I remember, um, after nine 11, um, I was actually supposed to be working that day at the UN and that got canceled. And my audio guy had called me and said, Hey man, turn on the TV. So I was blown away. I lost, you know, people that I knew in 9-11. So it was pretty impactful. And especially working in Manhattan all the time, I just, I couldn't go down there, you know? So I don't remember how long it was afterwards um, that I think, I think Paula got in touch with me and she said, you know, Orville's coming to New York. They're, they're, they've asked him to go down to uh, the little church that stood. It was like right at the foot of 9-11. Uh, right, I think it's St. Right. Paul's um, yep. that they were hosting all of the rescue workers there. They were feeding him. They had, you know, triage if anybody needed whatever they needed, health care there, um, the workers. So I went down there and it was just like it was the first time down there. So seeing all the little memorials and things people had set up and um, and, and just being with Orville and um, and Dave Chief was there also. and Paula was there and they unchained. I remember they took these heavy chains off the back doors of the church because they they locked them. That went right out to the footprint of a uh, building one, I believe it was. And it was just like, I mean, I can get emotional thinking about it now. Um, but what really, really struck me um orville did a pipe ceremony a healing pipe ceremony um i know very little lakota words um you know wash day cola um washishu you know thing i i don't speak the language so i did not know what he was saying but the vibration dude of what he put out there i started weeping man i mean i could start weeping now i mean yeah. it was such a blessing for me to be there because it was a healing for me i did not know the the verbatim English of what he was saying, but I could feel through his presence and through his words and just looking at his face and just doing this, this pipe ceremony. It was, it was, it was, I couldn't have asked for any other kind of healing to get me down there and pass through. So I'm really grateful for that, that relationship with him and, and to have that experience. And, um, you know, and again, to be able to sit with, with people who were like, to me, they were like, you know, Indians or you know, Native Americans, First Nations people, they're like something out of history. And to be invited into that inner circle and experience the kind of things that, that you and I were invited into, not, let alone just, you know, you know, we were accepted. To be accepted into the culture is a huge, huge blessing, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, I always kind of felt like Harvey was for me, kind of like a gatekeeper because he mm -hmm. had, he had proven himself time and time again, that he, when he was out to do his projects, he wanted to record people's messages and their words on their terms, share their history as they wanted to share it. He was just kind of a conduit. He was just somebody who was collecting that information, put it back. You know, I'm sure that there's a style that he had too, but that came into things. So there's his own little thumbprint on it. Right. But 
it was very true and honest. And so I felt like when people, when I kind of walked into some of these rooms with people, they, they're like, you're with Harvey, sit down. And there was an acceptance right through that. Maybe there would be a different gatekeeping system with that kind of thing. And if, you know, if we were just to walk into room on our own and, or it's a timeline where I felt like I was, it kind of, it was very expedited for me, you know, like right off the bat, there was like, okay, we, we trust you because we trust Harvey. Right. And that meant the world to me, you know, because then I could really, it just, man, we, we were exposed to so Mm. many amazing people, experiences, ceremonies, you know, I know that I've, I've been in, it, when there was a, you're talking about like when he had a Chinupa ceremony there in, in New York in August, right before then he, at the United Nations gathering is, I, I don't think it was the indigenous people's day, but it was something to, to honor indigenous people. And mm-hmm. he was the person that they brought to be like the, yeah. the main keynote speaker. And he was out front and it was so hot outside. It was like in the hundreds, which was just crazy for New York and Texas. I'm like, Oh, cool, man. A cool day. <laughs> <laughs> Summertime. Right. But well, he, South Dakota also from where he's yes. from. I oh, mean, he knows he's thing. like, Oh, this is, this is fine. No big deal. But they're yeah. like, we got to bring everybody in. It's super hot. And they ended up having a Chinupa ceremony inside the United Nations building, which wow. had been a prophecy that was fulfilled from a vision that, can't remember if it was Dave chief or if it was Orville that kind of escapes me. But I remember they were talking about that and like lunch afterwards and how amazing that was that, that they're like, we've been praying about this and this is going to start healing. And like, this is like the second time I'm with them. I'm like, yeah, happening. This is amazing. And mind blowing. Right. So, so so for those who are listening, who don't know the Chinupa is the sacred pipe and, um, and then Lakota way, um, you know, it's two pieces. It's red pipestone, which only comes from one place on the earth, which is pipestone, Minnesota. So that's where they get the pipestone from. And it's fashioned in many different ways. The traditional pipe just kind of looks like a, a T. And then it's the, it's the sacred feminine and the divine masculine coming together, the two pieces. So you take the bowl and the stem. And when they connect, they only connect when the pipe is going to be smoked or prayed with. It's a sacred union. And the Nick Nick it's called, or um, it's not tobacco, but it's a, a mixture of different uh, herbs that go into the pipe. This is how the prayers are, are rising up, going to the creator. So to have these Chinupa ceremonies is a really very blessed and sacred thing. And in the, the stories go even back when, when the nations were warring, if a medicine person would bring this Chinupa or the sacred pipe onto the battlefield, everyone knew they would, they would stop. It was kind of like, okay, time out. Let's stop killing each other. Let's, let's counsel. And let's talk about peace here. So that's how powerful that that sacred pipe or Chinupa is. And to have that experience, yeah, it's, it's pretty wild for sure. We'll be right back after this. Hey guys, this is Waska. Listen, if you're hearing my voice, there are no coincidences. Are you ready to get unblocked and take the next step forward, whether it's with relationship issues, finances, or just moving into the next phase to elevate yourself? Listen, bros, this is what I do. I'm here for you. Drop me an email at waska, that's W-A-S-K-A, at illuminatedwarrior.com. We will work on this together and take you to the next step. I promise you'll be glad you did. And I just want to touch upon like Harvey because Harvey to know Harvey was was to love Harvey. I mean, Harvey, just like you were saying, bro. I mean, Harvey was his own person. Like he had his own way. He he never pulled like minced words or pull punches. Like he tell you the way it's going to be. And that's that was Harvey. And, and you just got to love him for that because he did speak out for for the people. You know, and the people being those who are less fortunate. A lot of uh, as you said, the indigenous people and uh, Aboriginal people. And he really, really put his whole life and career on the line to do those things. So we'll, let's talk about Leonard Peltier. So I got involved um, with Harvey, with Leonard, and it was a couple of um, different rallies that I went and, and recorded and documented. I remember there was one in Manhattan. We did a march and uh, Rage right. Against the Machine was there. And it was, it was you know, they were all there. Um, Matheson was there who wrote um, a book about it. Um, I think, uh, I don't know. Fred, Red, Spirit Robert of Red Crazy Bruce, Horse. Spirit of Crazy Horse, yeah. yeah. And um, and it was just amazing. And I remember um, 
uh, Harvey and I talked about getting in to see if we could get into Leavenworth to actually video um, Leonard, which of course they didn't let us. But um, and actually, I'm pretty sure I can't be 100 percent sure. I think my phone was actually tapped for a while because we were having conversations about that. And there was some weird click, you know, story for another time. But but this is how powerful experience like, the same right things that were very odd. And yeah, yeah. Yep. but this is how yep. powerful Harvey was and, and his he's like, just like whether you want to compare him to Mother Teresa or any of these uh, Gandhi and I would I will compare him to them because he was one man with a with a heart of gold who did amazing, amazing things to help those who, who really needed help. So let's talk about Peltier. 1975 shootout on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Uh, Peltier and Rabadou and uh, three Native Americans get ambushed by like hundreds, literally hundreds, every law enforcement uh, agency around. I mean, it was definitely a setup. So um, not to go through the entire story, but I do encourage listeners to check out Leonard Peltier because it's, it's well worth all the knowledge that comes with this man who has fought for all of our freedoms and who has been in jail, incarcerated and treated very, very poorly, not even getting his basic health needs met um, for our freedoms. So um, so let's talk about that, man, because you did some work and you got the poster behind you here. Let's like, you know, bring it to life, brother. Yeah. So um, I was first, I guess it was in in the year 2000. Uh, one of my buddies played me the documentary called Incident at Oglala, which was uh, narrated and produced by Robert Redford. And it is about an hour and a half timeline of the events that led up to what happened beforehand, what happened on June 26th um, in 1975, and then what happened with Leonard and his case going forward. There was two FBI agents who were in civilian cars and in civilian clothes who were saying that they were serving a federal warrant for the theft of some cowboy boots um, to a man named Jimmy Eagle, who had a red and white truck. Uh, basically, they followed him into the reservation on the Pine Ridge Reservation near the Jumping Bull compound. A firefight ensued. At the end of the firefight, the two agents... Uh, were killed as well as one native american man and um it's super tragic uh shouldn't have happened and there's a lot of controversy about this because there was originally four people who were arrested for the alleged murder of these agents one the charges were dropped two got off on self-defense as the firefight started they came back they were receiving gunfire they fired back they, they were tried and Leonard Peltier should have been tried with them, mm -hmm. but he did not feel like he was going to get a fair trial. They escaped barely from the reservation as all sorts of paramilitarily trained agents came after them. Can I interject um, a story? And, I, yes. and then I want you to finish. Yes. So I don't know if you know this story. So Pel Peltier wound up escaping and going to, to Canada, which I'll let you finish that. Mm -hmm. I remember hearing this story. So uh, Peltier was um, down like in a drainage ditch. I mean, they were surrounded by hundreds of agents, as you, you're saying. Um, and this is the native spirit. This is the native way. This is the indigenous way of connecting with nature. He called upon the elders, upon Great Spirit, upon Wankantanka, and, and an eagle shows up and literally guided them through this crazy way to get off tree that jumping to boat. tree. Yes. Escaped, which was would be like like unbelievable being surrounded by hundreds and hundreds of agents so i just wanted to get that story in there because that that to me is a, a true like connection with spirit that would never happen you know otherwise right oh, absolutely absolutely no it it was that story gives me chills and it led that eagle led them to the one only one way that they were able to get off of that area of land because they were surrounded, but it was like a drainage. It's everyone was able to escape. Joe Stunts, the Native American, mm -hmm. was shot in the forehead by a long range sniper, and his death was never investigated. And that was the one person who did not make it off, uh, aside from the agents, you know. And again, I, I pray for their families too. That what happened is is a tragedy all around. You know, three people should not have lost their lives that day. And it's a miracle that more didn't. Yeah. And 
you know, with Peltier, like I was saying, he had, he had not felt like he was going to get a fair trial. He went to Canada. He was awaiting extradition charges. They were trying to bring him back and try him. There was a delay. So the judge who decided to go ahead with the trial of, of the first two gentlemen that were, um, uh, you know, that eventually were released on self-defense. So had Leonard been there with him, with the other two, he would have gotten off on self-defense at the very end of it. There was one person left to go after and they needed somebody to be able to take the full on blame of this tragedy. And, um, they had false witnesses, false testimonies, affidavits, the head prosecutor has even said, we don't even know exactly who killed those agents. Yeah. There is so much uncertainty. There are so many classified files and through the freedom, freedom of religion, sorry, freedom of information act. There has been so much information that has come to the forefront about faulty ballistic tests, yes. things that should exonerate Leonard and immediately. And yeah. if, these same things were brought up in today's times in these cases, he would have walked a free man yeah. on self-defense or all these other charges that were falsified. All these, all this evidence, like he, he, he would have been here with us talking. Even the former head of the FBI acknowledges that it was done incorrectly. And that, and there's still thousands of tens of thousands of documents that have not been released that they, they, even if so, he served his time already, you know, and, and that's exactly right. That's, and next week I'm going to be interviewing Kevin Sharp, uh, judge Kevin Sharp. He is now Leonard Peltier's attorney. He's a former, a former U S district judge, an amazing individual. And that's kind of, he, he talks a lot about like the mandatory minimums and the things that are going on. Like if he has served his time, yeah. he should be released. And, you know, right now, unless there's a retrial or a parole, his main chance is executive clemency, which comes from the stroke of a pin from the president. Everyone thought Clinton was going to grant him executive clemency. People hoped that Obama would. Um, yeah, I know that there was a big push with Trump. People thought with his, you know, detest yeah. with the FBI, that maybe this would be something that would happen. But as each time as a president's had this on their desk, the FBI has called a meeting, the head of the FBI before Absolutely. it was J. Edgar Hoover. It's like, there's been multiple people along the way, and there's been a very large campaign to make sure that he does not uh, yeah. set free. I mean, the man is, he's in his late seventies. He has heart problems. He's a diabetic. He is at no risk to hurting anybody. And he never was, never was, no. you know, it, the only thing that he was guilty of is being there on a day to defend the women and the children and his people from what had been going on for years on that Pine Ridge and why he was asked from the American Indian movement to show up and help protect 62 or 67 murders. Uninvestigated. Uninvestigated. The governor of South Dakota said, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but he talked about the numbers that lived on the reservation and the total number in the state. There were more murders yeah. in those years from the reservation than the entire rest of the state. Yeah. All, and they were all traditional elders who were trying to, you know, the beautiful, good life, speaking the truth, life. who were silenced for, for living it, with their birthright. Right. I mean, absolutely. And it's like, like with Clinton, um, I was a little close to that because I'd met him a number of times. And actually, I know he for forgot that I actually try to throw him under the bus, which I'll get to that story in a second. I, I saw him. I was doing something with uh, for, those, for those people. Most people on the show, I think, know I, I've been doing professional uh, video and television production for a long time. So um, he lived up in um, um, Westchester. I forget the name of the town. But anyway, he was like walking his dog up there. Well, I'm not even going to go into that story. The, the, the back story is. I did. The, I shot the U.S. Open for 16 years, right? And this is, mm -hmm. you know, in the midst of what's going on with Peltier. And I was really hoping that 
Clinton was going to pardon him. So I was probably like 15 feet away with a bunch of other camera guys, camera on my shoulder. And I told my audio guy, I'm like, you know, this may not go so well, you know? And I'm like, so Mr. Clinton, Mr. Clinton, he looks over. I'm like, are you going to free Peltier? And he gave me a look like he, if, if, if looks could kill, he just looked at me like, do not ask that question. Who the hell are you? Like, I thought the Secret Service guys are going to come after me. And then he just turned and went, went into the, into the building of the U.S. Open. But it's like, dude, Come on, really? I mean, and I think he would have, but like you said, the FBI has made sure that this man is, according to them, is never going to be free, no matter you know what time he served, no matter what evidence has come out. And this is a problem, you know, that that's really for all of us. You know, this is our this is our basic human rights being violated, and, and this man is standing for all of us. Really, absolutely. Uh, I have to tell my Clinton story too, as well. Because I had one where he spoke at Northeastern University. They were given a certain amount of tickets for um, the students. And I wasn't one that was either, I didn't get there in time or it was a lottery. I kind of forget how it went. But my buddy, uh, Justin Bolanino, he ended up getting some tickets and he's like, Hey, are you going to go? We're going to go together. And I was like, I don't have one. And he's like, I'm going to give you this on one condition. And I was like, What's that? He goes, you meet Clinton, you look him in the eye and you tell him to free Peltier. And I was like, I can't accept him <laughs> on those. How am I going to get to president Clinton? And, you know, I'm sure they're going to be like, Oh, this guy. You know, like. So we ended up finding our seats and we're like in the second row. It's like the old uh, ice hockey arena. So there's kind of like a floor area and then there's like a second level up. And so we're in that and whenever there's a uh, silence and you know, after some applause, a few of my friends and I might've yelled free Leonard Peltier, you know, I was like, all right, I've, I've that's the admission of that ticket. Right. I've, I've done my part. And then uh, as the event ended, he Clinton goes and starts shaking everyone's hand in the front row and he's kind of walking by everybody. And so my buddy's like, go down there. So I jumped over this little railing which I know got attention for people because they were like security oh, guys. Yeah. Like, oh, we got someone coming in. <laughs> and I remember going through and I was trying to get to the front. I wanted to shake his hand, tell him my, my thoughts. And I mean, I was probably about four or five people, you know, almost like rows away from where the, you could get in line to shake his hand. And all of a sudden I feel this, huge blow to the side of my head a secret oh, wow. service agent Oof. elbowed me into my temple and i went down and i was very dizzy and i snuck underneath two people's legs and kind of got in the very front and i was like I'm not trying to hurt anybody my hands are here i just want to shake his hand i just want to shake his hand that's all and they like were right behind me and didn't remove me but they were definitely watching i was like here's my hands not trying to hurt anybody just want to shake his hand and so i think they were kind of confused on what to do he came around and I grabbed his hand and I was like, you know, thank you very much for coming here today. Are you going to be freeing Leonard Peltier? And he tried to walk away and I held onto his hand and pulled him back. And I was like, you're just a man, but you have a man, you're a man who has an opportunity to start a great healing in this country. You need to do what's right. You know, what's right. You need to free Leonard Peltier. Senator Kennedy was the next up. I said the same thing to him. He <laughs> fell. Yeah. And as soon as they walked by, I, I floated out of that building. Right. I was grabbed by two of the largest men I've ever seen. And they <laughs> just escorted me out and said, don't come back. And Hey, freedom was, of speech, man. Freedom of it speech. It was. And you know, and I realized now I'm like, that's really risky. Cause it's like, I was kind of like bum rushing the president there, but yeah, but of course at the end of the day, they told Leonard's family to prepare for him coming home. They bought him a new suit. Yeah. They started preparing his favorite food for his meal. Everyone thought he was yeah. coming home. Yeah. The papers were on his desk. Yeah. And everybody was announced in the uh, criminal Michael day. Milken gets out. All these other, uh, these no oh, rich criminals yeah. get his out. But Leonard Peltier, you know footnote and then we see on the news it's running the list of mm. who is granted executive clemency 
and uh, his name wasn't on. It just yeah. it renewed my focus and wanting to make sure that I did whatever I could. And r- right after that, that's when Harvey and I started working on the Have You Thought of Limited yes. Peltier Lately book. Yeah, was, let's talk about was, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, that's a beautiful I mean, project, man. Thank you, man. Thank you. Um, that Harvey wanted to put out a, a second book. He had been the editor for Prison Writings, My Life is My Sundance, yeah. which it was Leonard Peltier's book that he wrote from prison. Right. Um, well, all of his books. Um, but he, um, there's a lot of poetry. He's talking about what it's like day to day. Uh, it talks about his people and like there's you know, references to his artwork. I mean, th- he's such a fascinating individual. Leonard is such an amazing soul. And this book really, it's, it's, it was very deep. And whenever Harvey was working with his publishers, he had gone through, I think 35 rejections until mm-hmm. a, a publisher finally picked it up. And then there was all sorts of press and attention that had was, I mean, it was full steam ahead. And then all of a sudden the publisher was like, we're not going to do any, any publicity on this. We've been asked not to do any. You got a call. Of course. And they it's did. like, yeah. what? And they, so it, I mean, it was still a very successful book because there's millions of Peltier supporters around the world. I mean, millions yeah. of people know that he's where he shouldn't be. Well, and, and they, look, look at, look at all the big names, you know, Desmond Tutu, may he rest in peace. Uh, the Dalai Lama, like, like major, major Mother world Teresa. leaders, Mother Teresa, yep. all Nelson advocated Mandela. for him yes. to be released. So you got to look it, at that, right? Absolutely. It's not just like a group of a couple friends or, or maybe his family. Yeah. I mean, it is millions of people millions across the entire world everybody realizes if you really take the time to look into the details of what happened there is no way that you will come across feeling that he did not get a fair trial that he is where he shouldn't be he should yeah. be at home with his family that it is impossible not to look at all the bountiful evidence and 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 feel otherwise it's impossible well well the shonda the the the, the shame of it is that yeah, he is getting old. He's not in great health. He he doesn't get to actually physically touch, see, or be with his grandkids. And you know, and they're they're you know, the powers that be are doing their best to make sure he does not ever leave confinement. You know, and that's, that's right. why, like, for those who don't know what, what a Sundance is, is a sacred. You know, one of the sacred rituals that Native people do. Um, and he calls that his Sundance, his the great sacrifice for the people. This is this is his great sacrifice. And if you ever hear um, like prison writings or the, the the CD that was done also, and Robbie Robertson mm-hmm. puts it in his songs, another great Native American artist. Um, you know, my life is my Sundance. I I sacrifice for the people. Like and and, he, and Leonard says it. There's been millions of stories, millions of stories. This is just one, which is really sad because there's millions of very very similar stories that you don't even hear about it, man. Like you're saying before, you know, we know 60 something people on, on, you know, investigated. There's so much, so many more than that. You don't even hear about it because they're, sure. you know, back to Clinton, he went to Pine Ridge Reservation back early nineties, I think, and declared it as the worst, you know, most impoverished place in the United States. Very, very little was done after that, you know. So, and these are people who were were taken from, you know, these great United States Turtle Island, man. This was all of theirs, although they didn't view it as theirs because they don't believe that you could own land like like the colonialists who came here, like, you know, I'm going to own that land. This is mine. This is mine. And divided it up and put lines. Native, native, traditional native thinking is not that way. This is, you know, as the saying, Matakwiasen, we're all, cre- you know, created equal. All we, we're all one, mm-hmm. all my relations, you know, that what a, what a great way to live, you know, and that, and we're not seeing that in, in government, like really ever, you know, I'll, I'll say ever, you know, cause it's, cause it really fires me up that this man is still being imprisoned. And you had sent me a box of, have you thought of Leonard um, Peltier? And I gave them out to like all my brothers who I was working with at the time and anybody who who was open to reading it because it's such an important story and will remain an important story that I don't think enough people are really um, aware of. So power to you, brother, for keeping this story alive and keeping the the momentum going because it's, it's, it's not a Native American story this is this is a a human being a humanistic story that we all really need to know and and get behind because he's he's 
he's doing the Sundance. He's sacrificing for you and me and everybody. He really is, you know, yeah. for human rights. That's right, man. He totally is. He, it's it's time to to let him go home to his grandchildren. Yeah. He needs to go and, and be with his family. Absolutely. About the time that he has left and, and as much peace and comfort. And, you know, if he doesn't want to, you know, step foot in the public eye, that's fine. You want to, yeah. I just want him to be there with his family and his yes. friends and he just deserves be able that. to breathe the fresh air and let the sunshine hit his face and really feel what it's like to be alive again and not behind bars. I, I can't imagine the kind of strength that it takes for someone to go through that. I mean, 47 years. I mean, yeah. this, this June 26th was 47 years. It's, it's that, insane. That, uh, More from, of, from this. Right. He was younger. He was in his, his 30, I think he's 30 at the time or early, you know, he'd been in there longer than he was free. You know, right. he spent his whole life in there, treated like horrendously. Um, I want to talk just briefly about Dave yeah. Chief, who was his spiritual advisor, because um, you you know, you met and, and sat with Dave Chief. Huge man, um, huger, huger heart, soft-spoken man, but really, I mean, my impression of him was like, wow. You know, same thing, to be in this man's presence, um, who exuded love, who exuded you know, just that Matakwiasen, and like, you know, all my relations, like that, that was his, that's what I always got from him. And and he was there obviously for Leonard as well. And for Orville. Um, so you have any sh stories you want to share about uh, Dave? <laughs> the first time I ever met Dave chief, I was at, there was a, a ceremony that was going to be going on with chief Orville looking horse with Dave chief. And there's a few other individuals and I was asked to go and keep the fire going inside a teepee that we had set up on this property and to make sure that it was burning and not going out for 48 hours. I had never been a part of anything like that at the time. And I was just like, okay, they're like, this is the sacred fire. You have to keep it going. I was like, okay. So I'd yes. sleep out there. It was cold. And I remember when it got there, some other people came in and they kind of took over and they were like the fire keepers for, for that. And I went and slept in the living room and I remember waking up and it was like barely the crack of light out. And mm. I opened my eyes and there's Dave chief looking over me and sitting in a chair, <laughs> a mountain of a man, <laughs> big man. And I'm like, uh, hello. And he was like feet away from me. <laughs> you awake? Uh, yes, sir. I am now good. Go get the coffee going. <laughs> and every morning, that is how I woke up for three mornings. The good alarm, Dave man. Chief waking me up. And you know, <laughs> we got coffee going and he and I sat for like an hour, hour and a half. I think one day we might've had someone else that joined us, but he just woke me up and wanted to talk to me. And we just had the most amazing conversations. And we it was, it was some of the best like moments of my life to yeah. like it, it just, I can't believe that, that I had that experience. And he was talking a lot about, you know, he helped organize the walk across the United States. Yeah. The Bigfoot that, walk, the Bigfoot that walk. One, yeah. And that was, and so he was telling me all about that and all the things that he had kind of worked on in his life. And then we just chatted. We talked about yeah. soccer, about music, about all sorts of things, but he told me about, you know, the Bigfoot walk and how they ended on the steps in, in Washington. And it was a very large part of the freedom of religion act yeah. that I believe was enacted and in, in letting native American Indians practice their sacred ceremonies again. Cause so many of them were like illegal. You think about that, right? It's like, no, you can't say that. You can't do that. You can't wear that. You can't look like that. God bless America. You know, it's amazing. You know, is, is, it's, it's like the duality too of like being in a country where we're able to have these conversations and we can talk about our displeasure with certain things within our government or whatever else there is there are certain freedoms that are here that you don't have in a lot of other places and yeah. so I'm you know I, I have this this pride about that but I also recognize and I you know so many people I think they don't see the full 360 yeah of what happened and how our country became to be so vast, so powerful, it came on the back while of building bridges over the blood yeah. of all the Native American Indians who lived here, all the indigenous people. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, a lot of the 
the deaths that happened in, I, I know the number's gone from all sorts of places and they've said even a hundred million, but I know that a lot of them was, you know, they were the diseases that came over, killed them off rapidly. A lot but, of them intentionally though. Exactly. And so I mean, the small plox blankets here will yeah. keep you warm, but the, what happened in the, uh, the, the assassinations across the nations, like yeah. Taking out their, their food source, the Buffalo, the government paying for people to do that. Like there, yeah, there's so many things that people don't really understand fully about this injustices that has happened upon these people. And when you have folks who are starting to like Dave chief, like Leonard Peltier, who raise their voices and is like, we don't have much left, but what we have left, we're going to fight for. Yeah. We're going to fight for it on paper. And if it comes to fight for it in fists, they will. It's not like these are people who want to do that, but a warrior society is created when warriors are needed. Yeah. And people show up to do the right thing when it, they're called upon. And Dave Chief was someone who epitomized that. Yeah. What an honor we had to, to yeah. be able to. How, how did you yeah. first meet Dave? What was your? Um, well, thanks for asking. Yeah, on, on Long Island, there was a ceremony that um, that Orville was called to do a, a baby naming ceremony. So we did it in an, in an EP in a lodge, and uh, so I, mean, I think the first thing Dave said to me because I remember he, he's he's huge, and I'm wearing my my denim, my jean jacket, and I had a patch on that said Native American Music Awards because I was doing some work with them. I had directed the, the awards and uh, really liked that patch. I'm like. It's yours, you know, so I start ripping it off my jacket because I had sewn it on, you know, and he's like, no, 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 no. You, you, if you could get me another one, I'm like, Dave, seriously. And he's like, no, I don't want you to take it off. I, you know, when Dave yeah. Chief fancies something, I mean, you know, and, but he was like, no, I really, I wasn't saying that. But so right. after that, we just laughed and we, and then, you know, and it's like, wow, what a blessing. It was su such a, like I said, a mountain of a man you would expect like this gruff, you know, but he was so gentle and, um, and same thing, sitting over coffee, just talking. And then Orville would come over. He's like, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> I'm like, whatever he wants, man, because whatever he says, I'm like totally attentive to it. Cause he had so many great antidotes and, you know, again, hearing stories of the people, you would never be privy to knowing what really goes on, um, with like indigenous people if they don't share it with you. And, and, you know, again, I just feel so blessed to, to be able to sit with somebody like that, a spiritual leader, a, a, an icon of, of spirituality in his faith and to, to have these conversations. It's, it's, I just such a blessing. Um, so I want to like transition into, because you have two daughters and I raise sons. And, um, so my kids got the benefit of, um, of meeting Harvey and I, and I laugh because some of the stuff I'm not going to talk about that went on because you know Harvey you know Harvey oh, could yeah. be a little rogue uh, my boys were young at the time um, but they got to meet Harvey and they got to meet Edna they got to meet um, Orville they got to meet so many indigenous people that came through Long Island or I took my kids to meet them and I know how it's touched me because I really feel my life is so much richer so much more grounded and centered and like um yeah I was, I was raised in the Jewish Jewish faith which I'm proud of my upbringing and all but I like I I pray in, to the four directions how I was taught in the Lakota way you know I I really feel like such a kinship with Native American spirituality and that really translated into the way I raised my children and they definitely absorbed that as well we'll we'll, we'll still talk hey remember when um uh Robert White Mountain came to visit and they're like oh that guy so Robert White Mountain who I met out at, at a gathering in South Dakota he's like oh we're going to be coming up to um you know to Foxwoods to meet with some of the people at the casino there and, and to tell them about our, our warrior strong heart society and uh can you put together a lodge for us so um, you know we had built a lodge some land that we did ceremony on. i'm like absolutely when are you going to be there oh we'll be there like next saturday so i'm like all right keep in touch with me next saturday comes i'm like well, i don't hear from him like yeah, i get everybody together we get the wood we get the blankets we're, we're ready to do lodge we're ready to do ceremony robert doesn't show up i'm like i'm calling him i'm calling him like 
I'm like, I don't know, hopefully they're okay, you know. So Wednesday, I hear from Robert, oh, yeah, we just made it to the casino. And, uh, you know, we're talking. I'm like, bro, what happened, man? He's like, oh, you know, you know, Indian time, Indian time. So who those who don't know Indian time, Indian time is like <laughs> really the true essence of presence. I mean, they were present. They were they were they met some people they're you know talking about you know culture they're talking about how they could connect and like okay i'm like okay bro i'm like you know i get that i'm like but you know i'm not on indian time i got other peeps and bros here that are taking off work and we're going to do this ceremony um we will definitely be there you know uh by thursday the latest you know i'm like okay i said so are we doing this he's like yeah he's like you know we could do it thursday evening we'll be ready i, I told everybody else we had a good laugh about it I said, keep me posted. Thursday comes, Thursday goes, Friday, I don't hear from him. I'm calling, no answer. Sunday morning, you know, my wife, she's like, she's like, what's what's in the driveway? I look out, there's, there's this old beat up van with like the, the windows are totally steamed up. I'm like, well, Robert White Mountain is here, you know? So it was hilarious. So he came with his two sons and um, uh, one of the girlfriends and all, and they, they, got there late at night they passed out and you know so that was that was indian time and it was like so you know first i'm like bro come on man you get you got a cell phone you could call me he's like you know indian time i know i said i know but we, we you know we we twice we're getting this ceremony going yeah, for yeah. you so but but it was hilarious you got it you got to understand the culture and really truly being present and have that like you know i don't wear a watch you know these, these are my watches you know it's like so understanding how they actually operate, um, you know, does take a little bit of of understanding, you know. So it, it was great. Anyway, I turned them on to bagels, Long Island bagels. They're like, "Ooh, better than fry bread," you know. So <laughs> oh, that's like, a claim. I'll send, I'll send you home claim. with a couple dozen, you know. But uh, it was hilarious. So that's you know, that's Indian time. That's um, you know, the the gift that my my kids remember and laugh about these stories. So how how have your girls been affected by like your relations and your experiences with indigenous and native american people and even and you harvey my wife first met harvey in 2010 um we went to washington dc he was like the biggest redskins fan you would uh, watch which is i know that in and of itself it's like we can dissect that it was his 75th birthday so i was like you've never been to a game i'm taking you we booked this trip and we planned this whole thing. And I called the Redskins organization and I told them about that it was Harvey's a lifelong fan, who he was, you know, he worked at National Geographic. And they were like, one of the guys who answered was like, I know who he is. I've read some of his articles. So they gave him, we got like a, I got a jersey done for him. It has like 75 art. And then like they brought him a bunch of things so he can kind of have the like keepsakes. And so that was my wife's first introduction. And uh, it was cool because the day before I had proposed to her. So nice. we had like a huge <laughs> celebration. It was like the best weekend ever, you know, it was like, so we went and met up with them again at, um, at the native American music awards at the NAMIs, um, yeah. because uh, I had, I had put together a reissue of a CD, um, called my life is my Sundance on um, the prison writings from Peltier. And yeah. then there was another one that we had done, hadn't been, uh, released before called noble red man. Uh, Lakota Wisdom Keeper. And those two CDs were up for five different awards or four different awards. And then Harvey was up for the Native Heart Award, which is an award for folks who have had outstanding contributions in the Native American world, but were non-native. The My Life is My Sundance um, was uh, got the best book and word that year. Yeah. So that was like a really cool thing for Harvey and Leonard that they had, you know, worked on for a long time to to see some accolades there. You know, my kids actually never met Harvey. Mm, they were younger, um, right? They were younger than my kids. Yeah. My my oldest, um, in person, she never met him, but gotcha. she definitely knew his presence because I, you know, he well, was. Well, from your influence, I'm sure, because I know I know how it shaped me, and I know you well enough. I mean, th those situations, those experiences, have definitely shaped who we are today, man. I mean, listen, man, you get you you're still yeah. sitting with three Peltier behind you, and I'm still advocating. So, I mean, I know it's had a profound effect on us. So, it's it definitely has trickled down to our kids. Yeah, and we're rippling it back out, and you know, they're like, you know, I'm, I'm I know that they are very aware of Leonard. They are very aware of you know, Chief Orville of Looking Horse, and. And the struggles that go on and the celebrations that go on with, the, with these native and indigenous people all around the world. I remember thinking about when I went to Pine Ridge for the first time with Harvey and I did not realize, you know, like what you said with like Clinton was talking about the, one of the worst areas in, in the entire nation. And, yeah. 
And it's not because of the people there. It's the, it's the situation. It's, yeah. you know, half of the people are, are, are addicted to alcohol. There's rampant drug abuse. There is very, it's very difficult to be able to thrive and succeed on reservations. Yeah. You know, it's, it, there's a lot of things that people just don't understand. You talk about third world countries and I'm like, there are places oh, in, in this U- country US. and it's not, it's not just native American. It's there's boroughs, there's places where there's in yes. inside of their cities where there's people of all color and backgrounds that have hardships. Inequity and inequality within this country, people yeah. would really benefit from, from knowing these stories, from realizing how truly blessed we are. And, and there's always something to give back. You know, we always have part of us that we could give back that I think it really is incumbent upon everybody. You know, I, I was having a like, oh, poor me, poor me day yesterday. And then I spoke to one of my bros here and he's like, oh, Chunk, his dog. Um, he's like, I got to euthanize him. I don't even have enough money to, to euthanize Chunk. And like, I think I'm going to be moving into a sober house for 200 bucks a month because I can't afford my rent. And I'm like, I felt so ashamed of myself. I'm like, what am I? I was complaining about some mundane BS. I'm like, wow, dude, you got a roof over your head. You got your health. You got beautiful family. I'm like, wow. And it puts things back in perspective. And I'm like, bro, let me know what you need. You know, I will help you, you know, yeah. because I can do that. And, and, and two minutes before I'm thinking like, oh, poor me. So I think perspective is really important for us to all remember that we do have blessings in our lives, whatever they are. And, and, and being in service, like to me, and I've taught my kids, it's so important. And that is a huge part of the indigenous culture as well, being in service to whatever you call creator, being in service to the environment, Mother Earth, being in service to our, each, each of us. Like what I love about the, the indigenous way is like, I've met so many indigenous people who like, oh, my, my brother, my auntie, my, and it's not necessarily what a lot of us, you know, think of as blood relations. They're like, I adopted him as my, as my brother. I adopted her as my auntie. I, because those, those relationships are just so important that it's not like, well, and, and if you think about it, I don't know about you, but like, I have better relations with people who I'm not blood bonded with, you know, but, but people sure, that like I've sure. chosen to be bonded with, like a lot of my native friends, which, really touches my heart because this past year i don't know if you if you knew joanne shenandoah she passed theta staley another beautiful uh, indigenous person passed and one of my mentors ocean of fastful passed now these are three warrior women who were super influential in my life they're gone now and I, I just do my best to keep their memories alive and keep in touch with their um families and relations but but i really think about those things and i think about I think about my own mortality. I'm like, wow, you know, what am I doing today, you know, to to help the cause of other people who are less fortunate? Because really, at the end of the day, um, you know, it can't just be I, me, my, you know, and I get it. You know, I like just like I just acknowledge I, I get wrapped up in that as well. But it's like we so all do. important, you know, sure. we sure. got it. We got to put it out there for the people, man. Free pelt deer. Yes. But <laughs> yeah. in, I like you could have been going through your own thing that was recognizably a difficult thing. And like you said, maybe you have a pity party or whatever, it knocks you down. But those things, even if they're small, like people, we have to recognize that we all have certain things that are difficult in the day. Some people struggle just to get out of bed in a day. Yes. And so, I mean, there's things that we take for granted. That it's like, it's very hard for some people to to do that, you know, and, and it, it, it's good that you're able to acknowledge both things. So many people get so absorbed about their own lives that they might not even have really listened to like your friend and his struggles of that day and what all, how big of a day that was for him and multiple facets. But like you're, you've always been someone who's attuned to being able to do that. And I mean, it is a quick reminder and it's like, there's a lot of times where it's like, (laughs) yeah, there's a lot of people have it a lot worse than me, you know, and we fail to put each other, like we fail to try on other people's shoes. We, we fail to look at it from other perspectives. I, I don't know if it was ever coined, but I always, I I came to this idea of like multi-perspectivism. I want to try to see every situation from every single possible angle and every single person's viewpoint, emotional state, mental thoughts, Yeah, like, you know, maybe, or spiritual, like however, like you really put some, 
put yourself into someone's real, like their place. What is, what is they, what are they feeling? What are they seeing? What, are, what is their life experience? Maybe why do they have this opinion? Cause some people are like, Oh, they think that way they're wrong. It's no, they're not. They're entitled to their opinion. That's their, whatever it may be. And it's, I see so much divide and so much uh, inability of other people to kind of really empathize, sit down. right? That's empathy. Yes. What I'm it hearing. is the, it's the key. It is, it is. That's, that's the, that's the thing that I think we need more than ever really to understand because the, the, the Matakuya Yas and the, we're all related. We are all related. We are all part of this thing called life. And it is, the, it's just, it's amazing how many different people see classify folks by color, by creed, yeah. by sexual orientation, by where country you're from. And you know, what political lines you're on. And it, it, I just see so much of that kind of divide and it, it just feels like almost like purposeful to keep us from finding it, our true it, happiness and our true calling, which is to be able to kind of make sure we have that kind of global unity, you know? Yeah. To connect and rise. I mean, why is Leonard still in jail? I mean, yep. it's because he's a voice of the people and the powers that be don't like this. And this is not conspiracy theories. The, the things we're talking about are actual, yep. there's so much wealth in this country. We'll talk about this country that yeah. nobody should be going homeless. Nobody should be going hungry. Nobody should be with lack of education who wants it. You know, there's plenty of jobs. Um, so the whole mindset has changed. And I think um, there's so much, I don't really watch TV. And when I do, it's like, you could always count on those, those, uh, pharma commercials or like that, you know, that, that's going to save your life, but, but it's also going to cause like anal bleeding, methyl hemorrhaging and all this other right. stuff, but, yes. but it's going to save your life to take these meds. And, the, and they, you know, they push for all of us to be on some kind of like pharma help aid. But we don't really, I'm not going to say like it's not necessary at times for certain situations, but most of sure. us, if we were eating or had access to healthy food, clean water, fresh air, be able to commune with nature and had the support system, you know, that's why I do the work that I do, man, connecting with brothers and stuff. I mean, dude, I hear so many stories of guys who are like having mental health issues because of the pressures that they put on themselves, but also that they're feeling out there in the world that, you know, women feel it also, but because I, I deal with guys so much, right. just, to, just the, the stigmas that we have from, from even when we're small, you know, well, you know, you're not going to amount to anything. You're not good enough or like stand up and be a man, all that rhetoric that just does not serve us. That really does carry through generationally, multi-generationally. And um, it's really time that we, you know, listen to those voices. And a lot of those voices are those indigenous voices. It's timeless, ancient wisdom that's so apropos for now more than ever that we really need to reconnect to who we are. You know, so the work that, that Leonard is still doing, the work that Harvey did, the work that Edna and Arvel and, you know, all of these indigenous people is so vital. These kinds of projects that you and I have been a part of, the projects will live on. Yes. And our, our name might be in the print at the very bottom of something. <laughs> But it doesn't, that's not, it's not on the top. We're not trying to, to do that. Yeah. We're trying to put this out, put those people's messages out, you know? And so I love that you're still out there helping people and putting the messages and everything first and foremost, mm -hmm. you know, because we've known each other for over 20 years yeah. now and yeah. being able to, to have folks who have that same kind of track record, like Harvey, like you, you, you can tell yeah. who's in it for the right reasons and you, you know, people who come in, they get spit out. You know, if you're in it for the wrong reasons, you're in there Absolutely. for the ego, for the fame, I'm going to do this. And he's like, they're out of that circle, man. Those, those people, yeah. they don't trust. They, they can smell that stuff coming a mile away. Well, a great analogy is when, when you go into an anipi or a sweat lodge, you go in with the wrong intention. Oh, you know, people say it's hot in there. You will, you will burn up alive. Whereas other people who are praying, who are in there for, you know, to be there with what well, I'll say the right intention is to be in yeah. there to pray, to heal, to cleanse, right. to, to ask for prayers for family and friends and those in need, you know, as averse to somebody who's going in there with ulterior motives, you know, it's a lot hotter, you know, so it's, sure a, I thought of that as a, as an analogy to what you're saying. So, you know, spirit first, man. Oh, I've yeah. seen people run out They're in a ceremony starts 
and they're not in there for the right thing. And the, they are running out of there. And it's like, yeah. they've either been spiritually chased out or it's yeah. like, we're walking through these mazes and, yeah. you know, are you allowed through this door? Yeah, you are. And then you got to know and respect what doors you're, you're let through. Cause you and I've sat Absolutely. at the feet of some people that are remarkably hard to get that kind of closeness and, and them to talk to us like you had with Dave chief or like I had with coffee, you know, and like yeah. sitting down with some of these people, man, it's very like to begin, like the very beginning of the podcast, you're talking about this. Like, yeah, very few people I can talk about this. Yeah. Too. So of course well, I'm like, yay. <laughs> we, we could go on and on and on, but yeah. you know, um, which I really hope um, either I'll have you on the show again, or I'll be on your show or both. Yeah. Um, so before we wrap up, cause we could go on for hours, man. I mean, this, is, this is, this is the goal, man. Where could people get in touch with you that they like, if they want to connect or see more about your work? Um, thanks for asking and sharing. Uh, right now I've kind of built the central hub being at son of a Cause when you got a name like blitch, you got to do something with it. Right. <laughs> I've been a son of a bitch all my life. So uh, the podcast is probably, I mean, that's the thing that I'm really diving into the most right now. I love now. it. Son I of my like bitch podcast. Yes. Son of a bitch. Yep. Beautiful. Well, this, you know, like I said, we could go on, man, but this has yeah. been awesome reconnecting with you and sharing these stories. And I hope, you know, some of this wisdom seeps out into the, uh, into the listeners and they connect with, uh, with some of these uh, elders, with, with us, with whatever seeds have been planted yeah so it's been awesome my brother man you as well and and thank you for all the work that you're doing and thank you for everything you're trying to do to, to help make men be better men and to become their 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 full potential in selves and um you know you're doing fascinating work always and i'm i'm i am i'm proud to know you it's an honor to call you my friend and uh I'm, I can't wait for all the future decades to come and the more stories we can share together, my friend. Oh, yeah. It's like mm -hmm. this wisdom, we have the opportunity to, to soak it in. Some people don't share it. And we are definitely the folks to kind of share it. And we're yeah. just bridge keepers of that wisdom. We're bringing it out to the next people, the next generations. And hopefully it can continue to help and heal those seven generations down the line. Aho. Aho. All right. Well, as I always end the show, Let's just continue to illuminate our paths with love and kindness. Visit illuminatedwarrior.com if you'd like to go deeper and find out more about what's available within the Illuminated Warrior men's transformational community. Tune in next time for more candid conversations for men and women about men on the way of the Illuminated Warrior talk show. Until next time, illuminate your path with loving kindness.